pretty much everybody, right? So, how many of you know exactly what is Lean Startup? Okay. Uh, uh, so, how many of you are aware of uh, the definition of Lean Startup, at least as quoted by uh, Steve Blank? Okay. Uh, so, that, that's great. So, what we'll do is like we'll quickly start off with uh, some context and then I'll move on to uh, what my talk is about. Uh, so, a startup is a temporary organization uh, which is set in place to find out what is that business model which is repeatable and scalable. So, this is a startup. A startup navigates through uncertainty to find out what are the different variables. It can be who is my customer, who is the, what is the problem I'm trying to solve, how, what should my product be. So, all these variables are very uncertain when you start off with an idea. So, when there is uncertainty, this temporary organization is called a startup. When you apply the lean principles uh, to this startup, you, what you basically get is the lean startup. And lean is all about reducing waste and uh, lean has, uh, has been applied in uh, manufacturing and likewise it's been applied in startups. But the nature of how you apply uh, lean is changes quite a bit because uh, uh, there are a lot of different uh, aspects to a, uh, a company like a startup versus a factory. Like the cost of change is too high in a factory versus the cost of change in a, uh, a software product is too low. And using these basic principles, what you get is a lean lean startup. So that's what a lean startup is about. And uh, uh, my talk today is about how we applied Lean Startup in a yoga product that we are, that we are building and uh, what are the challenges that we faced. My name is Manish and uh, I'm a product manager uh, at Multunus. So, so, let's get started then. So, uh, I, like I just mentioned, um, when you have an idea, what you basically have is a plan A. It is still just in theory and uh, most often than not your plans will change. The moment you release your uh, product into the wild, uh, it, may, it might not work the way you expect. So, it's all about going from plan A to a plan that actually works. And uh, so, this is our story. Uh, so, we are building a product in a yoga space and uh, what comes to your mind when you hear the word yoga? Right, meditation. Anybody else? What is that? Fitness. Fitness. Yeah. Postures. Postures. Peace. Peace. Right. So, like you see, like yoga means a lot of things for a lot of people. Yoga has a lot of forms, and a lot of lot of us seek towards yoga for different reasons. A few of us might look at yoga for uh, um, being fit and uh, be like staying in shape. Uh, a few more of us might look at yoga for uh, mental stability, dealing with stress and things like that. And a lot more people look at yoga for spiritual well-being. So, yo yoga solves a wide variety of solve, uh, problems for a lot of people, right? Uh, so, that's about yoga, but yoga as a business today is more, more than about uh, 80, 80 billion dollar industry. Uh, and uh, what this has also done is like a lot of yoga teachers are being trained in really good institutes. Um, and in recent years, uh, folks like Baba Ramdev and Modiji have not left their stones unturned in terms of ev evangelizing yoga. What this has created is a gap between how many of, how many people want to learn yoga and how many credible teachers are available to teach yoga, right? Uh, so, all these yoga teachers actually love teaching yoga. They, they are deeply invested in yoga, but unfortunately, like when they go ahead and start yoga studios, it does not uh, fill up all the gaps of starting a company, right? They are not uh, well versed with things like, okay, how do you do marketing? How do you do, how do you manage operations, finance and things like that? So, that's where good karma comes in. So, Good Karma is the suit of products that we are building at Multunus. Uh, so, 
it is supposed to help yoga studio uh, yoga studio owners manage their studios better starting from how do you get get customers to notice you how do you get them to sign up with you and how do you manage your day to day operations so i won't go into a lot of details about the product as such but i'll just give you a very quick example of what are the kind of things uh, it does so currently let's say uh, any one of us just decide that okay i want to do yoga from tomorrow i know that it is very beneficial and i am very excited like i want to join a yoga class what do we do right like we google yoga studios around us on our uh, smartphones and we are pro probably provided with like a 10 or 15 uh, yoga studios like we'll look at like what's nearby and like how much rating they have and things like that and then we go on to some of them have websites but unfortunately what happens is all of these are just that websites they are not designed or optimized for conversion right like you go to their website you get a few questions answered but that's about it they are not designed for conversion uh later on you might decide that okay let me give this yoga studios a phone call i will ask them like okay uh, what kind of yoga do you teach uh, do you have available slots and things like that but even then uh what most likely happens is you don't really get a response uh a lot of these studios are very small studios and they can't afford uh, like having a lot of people just taking phone calls so it's just the yoga teachers themselves uh, who have put up their phone numbers right so you don't get a response then what happens so i am really excited but the by the time like i go through all this uh i just decide okay let me come back to it next week uh, next weekend i'll think about it and that's about it right like i just don't come back to it ever again and the yoga studio just lost one of their leads so what we are trying to do is bridge this gap like one of the product is like helps uh, studios bridge this gap uh and our objective here is how can we get this person who is right now at this moment very excited and he is motivated to join a yoga yoga class to get him to book a trial class a free trial class so that is one of the one of the product that uh, we built and uh, we've been able to get people who um, who contact a yoga studio to booking a trial class in under 3 minutes so so that is an example so let me quickly uh, give you a back story of uh, how this all came to be right like so uh, so the team is sitting in a conference room um uh, we are having a skype call with uh, another yoga founder and uh, we are discussing about the product features and we are discussing what what are the problems they face and how the product can solve the problems uh, we get to discussing about uh, what what will be the pricing uh, uh some uh, previously some some founders found that uh, the pricing was too high and this time the the founder said like okay this is great uh, i like the product let's uh, uh, let's go let's try it and uh, so the call ends we we all high five and uh, what just happened was like we signed up the fifth uh, customer who was willing to pay now this the story doesn't seem very interesting as such okay what what's a big deal like fifth customer uh, but what's interesting is we hadn't built a product yet so uh we wanted to validate that okay are does the problem exist do, uh, do yoga studio owners find a uh, find value in a product like this and are they willing to pay and to answer these questions we really didn't have to build a product as such and that's what we did right now this story seems exciting and all that but uh, uh we've we've been very focused on de risking what is the most riskiest and so far uh, at least for that example uh, that i spoke about we've been uh, we, uh, we've had uh, the studios uh, have at least 226 uh, bookings so far right like this is a very big win for these very small studios who don't have a lot of firepower like uh, uh, the moment you walk out I, i'm sure like you'll be presented with all the billboards of flipkart uber uh you are very aware of all these uh, products but yoga studios nobody is aware of who are the good ones out there and things like that right so there is not much uh, attention 
uh, towards Yoga Studio. So it, this was a very big deal. Whatever leads are coming in, let's convert them. So the mantra we went with here is uh, don't sell what you can build, build what you can sell instead. Right. So this is this is the first key takeaway that I want uh, you guys to take uh, take home. Um, this, so the story so far seems a little uh, very nice, like, okay, things worked out pretty well, right? But uh, uh, it, it almost seems like the Dropbox story, story that you might have heard. And uh, uh, so whenever we hear stories like this, the feeling everyone gets is, uh, okay, lean startup. So let's, uh, let's just start selling and think about the product later and things will just uh, work out. Oh, well, not really. Uh, so we had a whole range of failures before we even got to this story. Right? Like this was just the most recent pivot. Uh, we learned our lessons and uh, we learned how to do uh, how to do this better. But uh, let's go all the way to the beginning, and now I'll take you through the journey of what are the kind of challenges that we faced. So it all started with our founder. Uh, So it all started with a founder who wanted to join a yoga class and he finally found one uh, that was unlike the other yoga classes, right? Like most yoga classes promise you that, okay, you'll lose weight, you'll, you'll stay fit and things like that. This was a little different. They focused on what uh, the completeness of the yoga and he was very excited and very quickly he, re he realized that to get value from yoga, what he had to do was be very deliberate at his practice and also be very consistent. Both of both of these, very difficult to do. Uh, how many of you have like started New Year resolutions that okay I'm going to exercise and who are still doing it? Anybody still doing your exercise? So it's very difficult. Just staying consistent is difficult. Now add add on top of that how to be deliberate, right? Like this was very difficult. So we thought let's try and solve this problem and uh, before we started building a lot of things what we thought was okay let's answer a few questions how badly do people face this pain how many other people face this pain uh, how do we solve this problem and okay whatever we come up with as an idea will it work in the real world so these were, these were some key questions that we wanted to answer so we decided to kick things off with a design sprint uh, how many of how many people here have heard of design sprints? Okay, so very quickly, a design sprint is a very structured process, which uh, which helps you brainstorm different solutions, uh, build a prototype, and also test that prototype with real users all within five days. It's a very time boxed approach to doing something uh, to answer uh, critical questions. So this is what we did. And uh, what we found was when we interviewed people, showed them the prototype, there were a few serious people who were interested in, uh, you know, solving this problem. And uh, the way we presented it to them, they, it, it was also interesting to them that they wanted to give it a try. Uh, how do we solve it? So we have come across a few uh, behavior science uh, models, so to speak. And uh, that is what we were uh, intending on applying it. Uh, the problem with the design sprint is that it only solves for the surface. It's, uh, so uh, what we get at the end of the design sprint is basically a, a series of mockups st stitched together, but nothing is functional yet. So you get a sense of uh, you know, how, how much it's resonating with uh, the, the users, but it doesn't really validate uh, long-term behavior change. That's why we decided to build a MVP and test it out. So we built an MVP, launched it with a few people, uh, like also got more people uh, from the same studio. Uh, what we saw was initially a lot of people were very engaged, but then it started tapering off, right? Like this is what we wanted to test. And uh, the feedback was that, okay, something wasn't working. Uh, so we continued experimenting, right? Uh, so we changed something like see if, saw if that was work, uh, working or not. So we did a series of experiments. A lot of them failed. Uh, a few of them succeeded. Uh, and we were getting very frustrated. The data was telling us that, okay, this is not working. Um, 
and this is a scenario that you all will run into very often. Um, not only your experiments will fail very often, but the data that you get will be very muddy, right? Like they won't be black and white, they will be gray and you have to take a call. Uh, while we were doing these experiments, we continued uh, um, talking to people one on one, right? Like we spoke to uh, beginner practitioners, we spoke to serious practitioners, we also spoke to teachers and founders to get more insights from like multiple perspectives. And this is where we found the next big insight, which is a big unmet need, which I spoke about way in the beginning. So this was a major pivot for us. We learned this, we learned about this unmet need because we were out there talking to people. And uh, um, yeah, we discovered that there is a opportunity to solve a, um, and create a big uh, business here. So the next takeaway is get out of the building. This is a very common common phrase we all hear, but what ends up happening is uh, what ends up happening is basically like we hear this and then say like okay let's build an MVP. We'll put it out there and we will rely on data to tell us like okay it is working or not working. We we tend to shy away from actually stepping out and talking to people one on one, uh, and this is very very hard as well, right? Like uh, if you have to talk to people, uh, in our case it was yoga studios, how do you talk to people? How do you get in touch with your, uh, these founders? So it's, it's very hard. Um, so. so we decided to go on this journey and start uh, building the product. And uh, the moment you start and start getting a little bit of traction, what it starts seeming like is like you're juggling a lot of things, right? Like, okay, on one hand, you have to get new customers, you have to onboard them, and then you have to make sure they are happy, they are getting the value, they are paying us, and a lot of things, right? It starts uh, becoming very chaotic. And that is where we resorted to uh, like uh, Ash Moria and uh, what he writes in his books. So one key thing that I would like to share with you, which will be very beneficial is something called a customer factory. So a customer factory's role is to take in unaware visitors and convert them into paying customers. Right? Like, but how do, you, how do we do this? So you can track a lot of metrics, but there are five key metrics that you should be looking at. First one is acquisition. So unaware visitor, how do you make sure that, okay, now they know about your product and you can identify them. Next is activation, like uh, did they use your product, did they find value in it? Third is retention, okay, they used it once, uh, but are they continuing to use it? Are they continuing to get more and more value from the product? Then comes the revenue, wherein, okay, they are using it, but eventually they have to pay, otherwise your business is not going to be sustainable. And referral, uh, are they happy enough that they are getting in more customers also? So th these are the five key metrics that you should be looking at. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, you might say that, okay, these are five key metrics, but it still feels like juggling to me. Uh, uh, what do I improve, right? That is when the theory of constraints com com comes into picture. Uh, so the best way to leverage this model is to set a goal, right? Like set a goal, like I need 50 paying customers in the next week. Now you can analyze like where is your bottleneck in this flow. So is the bottleneck that okay, are you even getting 50 customers in the first place? If you aren't, obviously the bottleneck is that uh, you, your acquisition is the bottleneck. So let's say you're getting 500 customers, but uh, nobody is paying. Now you have to again determine like uh, are they activated or are they just not paying? So you, you know, having this kind of a goal and then analyzing where is the constraint helps you at least have the clarity of mind that, okay, where do I focus? So um, a typical thing that we all tend to do is like have a huge backlog of product ideas and then start building them. Instead, this is an alternative approach wherein you focus on where is the constraint and solve that constraint for that week. And uh, continue to uh, create experiments and see if that constraint has moved away and are you closer to the goal than before. So similarly, in for uh, good karma, our first constraint obviously it starts from acquisition, and acquisition was our constraints. And the way we started was uh, 
Um, to get initial customers, we wanted to test the product out. So we resorted to, okay, we knew one or two yoga founders and we asked them for referrals. And parallelly, uh, that wasn't enough. So we also resorted to cold calls. Okay, we got a list of uh, uh, yoga studios through Google and like we just started calling them, right? So the process looked very typical. You prospect a list of customers, you call them up and try and set up a demo. And uh, during the demo, your goal is to get them to sign up for a trial. So that's what we did. But uh, a key challenge here is basically you need to have very thick skin because you're going to hear a lot of no's. Uh, a lot of people just do not want to hear you out or uh, are, are just going to plain tell you like, okay, why are you calling me? Uh, so at this moment, you need to stay focused and think about being curious about uh, what is it that you can uh, help them with and how do you solve their problems. So very soon, like once we got that figured out, we had a few customers coming in. Like our next problem was activation. We hadn't had the product yet, right? Like that's when we started building uh, the product. And uh, uh, so when we were doing these cold calls, we also happened to have uh, a good relationship with one or two studios who were very willing to experiment with us. That was a very big win for us because now we could try different ideas and they were willing to uh, help us out with that. So that is what we did, right? Like, um, but the, all of these experiments, uh, you cannot rely plainly on data. In early stages, uh, what, what ends up happening is you will not have enough data to make a statistically significant uh, decision. Uh, and that's why you need to take a call on more qualitative uh, information. Qualitative information is basically like uh, me talking to users, like getting their experience, are they delighted? Was it just satisfactory? Uh, um, and uh, we also used a combination of tools. We did not use Google Analytics and Mixpanel at this point of time. All we relied on was tools like uh, Hotjar, which, which allows you to track, uh, you know, what are the steps that the user took. So you just go through that and you know that, okay, the user is clicking here, but he is not understanding what to do next. So you kind of are able to take those uh, uh, feedback and optimize the product. So very soon, okay, we solved for uh, activation, but retention start, started becoming a problem. Uh, and uh, most companies, the mistake that they do is the moment they are able to activate a few people, they go on a uh, accelerate, accelerated mode of getting a lot of customers on board. Now, if you saw that, okay, we had only 226 uh, instant bookings, that might seem like a small number because we did not focus on getting too many um, studios on board very quickly. We wanted to make sure that okay, the studios that come, come, come to us, are all, we can also retain them. So here is where we used uh, some behavior science models like the BJ Fogg's behavior model and the hooked model. So using a combination of these, uh, we, may, we, we are still continuing to do some experiments to make sure that we have a very high retention rate. So this is the, while we are applying that behavior to our uh, uh, products, uh, the behavior also applies to us while we are building these companies. And what we feel is you cannot really control the outcome of the business, but what you can control is what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, in our opinion, uh, your, your focus should be on that because those will become the leading metrics of your product outcome. Uh, so measure how often are you talking to talking to uh, customers, talking to users one on one, right? Uh, also measure how many times are you finishing your experiments. A lot of times, what we do is we start experiments, but then uh, we keep on delaying the dates. Like, okay, due date is uh, next week, but I don't have enough data, so let me postpone it to next week. So you keep delaying those, these experiments. You don't learn fast enough. So. If you can just keep a measure of how, uh, how, how many times you're talking to customers and uh, uh, how many times you're experimenting, these will become your key metrics to make sure that you're actually learning fast enough. So these were the four key takeaways that I wanted to uh, leave you guys with. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think I'm over time. I'll be outside and we can talk about uh, even if it's design sprint or uh, lean startup, uh, uh, any questions. Thank you.